Please turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah, chapter 21. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that as we meditate on this part of your word together this morning, that you would open our hearts to see what you have to say to us in all due humility. And we pray that you would give us the grace to live in accordance with it, to the honor of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, as many of you know, those who laughed at me, <laughs> I've been slowly working my way through Jeremiah in chapel for quite a while, and this is where we're up to. Uh, Jeremiah 21 and 22 are a sustained indictment of the Davidic kingship. And as we read them, we are hearing words that God used as his instruments to tear down the monarchy. And I want us to come to these chapters with some big questions about kingship in the plan of God. This week, I want to think about how God's people fulfill their royal mandate in the church. And next week, I want to think about how God's people fulfill their royal mandate in the world. Uh, sadly, because um, <clears throat> COVID robbed me of one sermon, we won't get to the glorious alternative to Israel's kingship in Jeremiah 23 with its picture of the coming Messiah, uh, maybe next year. <clears throat> well, so far in Jeremiah, for those of you who didn't uh, stick around for the prequels to this, the word of God has systematically demolished uh, the temple, the Sinai covenant, and Israel's status as God's chosen people. And the final pillar of their identity as a nation is the Davidic kingship. And by the end of chapter 24, that's gone too. To see why, God takes us to one specific incident in the late, uh, late in the reign of Judah's last king. So let me give you a little bit of context. Zedekiah is Babylon's vassal. He's been toying all of his reign, really, with the idea of rebellion. He believes that with Egypt's assistance, he can hold Babylon off and survive independently, and his prophets are encouraging him to trust in God and to rebel against Babylon, but not Jeremiah. Jeremiah has been urging Zedekiah to submit to Nebuchadnezzar as God's instrument of judgment. Well, Zedekiah weighed the facts carefully, and he decided to rebel. And so the Babylonian army has arrived, and the king is now so desperate that he even sends envoys to Jeremiah, hoping that Jeremiah can arrange some sort of exodus miracle. Let me read verse 1. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, son of Malchiah, and the priest Zephaniah, son of Messiah. They said, inquire now of the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us as in times past, so that he will withdraw from us. Well, the wonders of times past is, of course, a reference to the miracles of the Exodus. In Zedekiah's mind, it was like Nebuchadnezzar was the new Pharaoh, and Judah is God's treasured possession, a people that he will stop at nothing to redeem. And what Zedekiah doesn't seem to get is the irony, right? The wonders that he's hoping for are Egyptian soldiers riding to the rescue. This is classic Zedekiah. He wants the God of the Exodus on his side, but he also wants Pharaoh on his side. The only thing he doesn't want is to be on God's side, submitting to God's terms. So how does God respond? Verse 3. <clears throat> Jeremiah answered them, Tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both man and beast, and they will die of a terrible plague. Or, if you want that shorter... Well, Zedekiah, if you want to switch sides and team up with the Egyptians, you're going to find out what it's like to have me as your enemy. These verses are all about reversal. See how, first of all, their own weapons are turned against them. 
to set a bit of a theme. And then God turns his own actions around. There's a subtle thing going on here where historically God rescued them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. But here the adjectives are reversed. God fights with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm. A reversal. Finally, the walls of Zion no longer protect God's people. Instead, they prevent the people from escaping while God exterminates them. It's a horrific picture, and it only gets worse. There's a terrible finality to verse 7 with God's judgment presented as a series of threes. After that, declares the Lord, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the people in the city who survived the plague, sword, and famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who want to kill them. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy or pity or compassion. <clears throat> Finally, Nebuchadnezzar appears in God's speech, but he's got no power of his own. He's just there as God's tool. The mercy and pity and compassion that are mentioned here at the end, they don't belong to Nebuchadnezzar. They are God's mercy, God's pity, God's compassion. From back in Jeremiah 13, when God said, I will allow no pity or mercy or compassion to keep me from destroying them. The background to this collection, uh, this distinctive collection of divine attributes is back in Deuteronomy 13. And it explains why God's reaction to Zedekiah's faithlessness is so extreme. Let me just read you from Deuteronomy 13. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, do not yield to them or listen to them. Show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them. The one thing that will cut you off from God's mercy and forgiveness is idolatry. It seems that Zedekiah's stance towards God is the stance of an idolater. And so God decides to treat him and his people like Canaanites. It's impossible to overstate, I think, how shocking these verses are. Their language is actually language of holy war, strike down, man and beast, Put to the sword. No mercy. And in the light of God's reply, we need to return to Zedekiah's hope in verse 2. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us. He was a king who had ignored God's command, but who now expected God to back up his disobedient choices with miracles. Is that idolatry? Well... An idol is a little model of a god that you can control. What you do to the idol, you do with the aim of influencing the god to give you the life you want. Idolatry is the manipulation of the divine for the service of self. Israel's king was supposed to mediate God's kingship and channel God's blessing to the people. And at the end of this section, Jeremiah calls God, calls, uh, uh, God calls the kings shepherds. But he reminds them that their flock is not theirs, it belongs to God. Today we are blessed to know Jesus as the good shepherd, the true king. And his goodness is the goodness of God, isn't it? When he speaks to his sheep, it's God's voice they hear. And this makes Jesus, in the New Testament, the ultimate model for human shepherds or pastors. Because God appoints pastors for his church, just as he appointed kings for his nation. And just as it was with Zedekiah, if a pastor treats the flock as his own flock and leads it according to his own desires, and if he makes the church's worship all about the gratification of those desires and justifies them theologically in the name of God, then that pastor is an idolater and he forfeits God's mercy and pity and compassion. That's not the worst of it. An idolatrous pastor decimates 
the flock. The verses we've been reading describe a city in which everyone is killed without exception. There's only one way to escape certain death. And though it's not a way that's open to the king or the nation as a whole, it is a door that some faithful individuals might perhaps pass through and live. And God explains this narrow way in the second section of the chapter. And he uses an ironic inversion of Moses' famous words in Deuteronomy. You know when he sets before Israel the way of life and the way of death and urges them, choose life. Remember that? Well, have a look at Jeremiah 21, 8. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says, see, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. Well, this life that will open up for the faithful few is not much of a life. They will escape with their lives means they will escape with nothing but their lives. The Mosaic Covenant is irreparably broken. The only life available now is the living death of exile. When a pastor teaches the flock to worship self and calls it worship of God, he condemns that flock to judgment. But God's purposes, praise the Lord, cannot be thwarted by any creature. And so in his kindness, he chooses that for some, judgment will not be the final word. I guess that's how every one of us in this room has been saved. As we cling to Christ in his death so that we may share in his vindication and resurrection. And it's how God will save some of the poor sheep whose shepherds worship idols and teach them to do the same. But the years they spend being pastored in this way will have been years of abuse, years of replacing the joy of salvation with the pleasures of the world. And that is on their pastor. The pastor decimates the flock by their idolatry. And the final section of this chapter shows us what the king's idolatry looks like in practice. Verse 11 is actually the start of a new section that runs all the way to Jeremiah 23, verse 8. And it steps away from Zedekiah's reign to pass judgment on the whole Davidic monarchy. Right? Zedekiah was not an outlier. He was just the last in a long line of corrupt kings, kings who replaced the Lord with themselves. Look at verse 12. This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. I am against you, Jerusalem. You who live above this valley on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. You who say, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forests that will consume everything around you. The house of David, back in verse 12, means the palace, but it stands for the dynasty. It's a play on words we're all used to from 2 Samuel 7. And in verse 13, when God addresses Jerusalem, he doesn't mean the people as a whole. He's still addressing the monarchy who treated Jerusalem as like an extension of their palace. It was an extension that basically made them feel untouchable. The final reference to the palace is actually the reference to the forest in verse 14. Solomon's palace had so much expensive cedar in it that it was nicknamed the Forest of Lebanon. And that forest nickname gets referenced, I think, three more times in Jeremiah 22. So this is all about the palace standing for the whole Davidic dynasty. Why did Zedekiah and all the other kings idolatrously serve themselves rather than God? Why did they do it? 
Well, as verse 13 explains, they felt invulnerable. Now, the specific language used to describe the valley and the rocky plateau implies that the monarchy has replaced God with itself. So when they say, who can come against us? They're talking about human enemies, but they secretly mean God as well. They don't believe God will be able to harm them because they don't really believe that he is God. And the consequences of that self-worship are absolutely devastating. The power that God has given them to rule, that power expressed in the city's towering strength has freed them from having to be just. And so they trample the weak. You know, the fundamental responsibility of Israel's king was to distribute God's justice among the people. Verse 12 stresses that this needs to be done every morning as the king's first priority. Justice takes many forms, but only one is mentioned here. The king must rescue the vulnerable from financial abuse by the powerful. And typically in Israel, that might look like unpaid wages or ripping off people who owed you money or even extortion. Right? The specifics varied from case to case, but at the center of each injustice was a violent abuse of power. Now, um, hermeneutically today, I've been drawing a line from Israel's king to the church's leader. But the one element of kingship that does not transfer across is its civil character, isn't it? Right? Israel's kings governed a whole society, a whole social system, but the kingdom of Jesus is not of this world. The rule that is exercised by the shepherds of his church is not temporal, it's spiritual. Now, of course, there have been periods in Europe's history when the church ruled both spiritually and temporally. Uh, there are parts of the world today, like many African countries, where church leaders have important civic roles. And we'll think a little bit about the church's role in the world next week. But for most of us in this room, pastoring a church means exercising a spiritual leadership that equips people to live in this world in a way that brings glory to God. Christian leaders are not kings. But actually, for this chapter, the difference doesn't matter. It, all it means is that the abuses of power that we will commit when we put ourselves in God's place will look a bit different. I'm going to guess that all of us have witnessed or heard tell of some of the ways idolatrous leaders oppress and abuse those under their power, both spiritually and physically. I don't think I need to spell them out. Don't have the time. Instead, I want to exhort you to be warned by Jeremiah and to be encouraged by Jesus. Why do we turn to Jeremiah anyway for a lesson on Christian leadership when we've got, I don't know, the pastoral epistles waiting for us in the New Testament? Well, I think because Jeremiah paints a picture of abusive leaders that we need to internalize. The horrific images of a fiery and merciless judgment that God brings against leaders who justify self-serving ministries in the name of God. Aren't those images dreadfully sobering? You can't contemplate them for long, I think, without wondering about your own ministry, your own idolatrous tendencies, your own deceptive heart. And a bit of fear and trembling is not a bad way to work out your salvation. It's where we need to begin, but it's not where God would have us end. God works in us by giving us the spirit of Christ who empowers us to be royal leaders who are gentle and humble like Jesus. Jesus, the king who set aside all the authority and splendor of the world's kingdoms to proclaim good news to the poor. That's the shape of our kingship in the church. A leader, or any other Christian for that matter, who puts on authority and splendor instead of the humility of Christ, 
serves the devil. So let's finish by remembering what kingship looks like when Jesus does it. We all know, but let's remember. He made himself nothing. He became a servant. He humbled himself. And because he turned his back on self and power, God gave him a kingdom that prevailed over every power. It was precisely Christ's embrace of weakness on the cross that made way for God's incomparably great power to bring an end to war in heaven on earth, to reconcile all things to him, to create the beautiful society of the church which makes his wisdom visible to the heavenly powers. Praise the Lord. Christ's kingship was then the model for Paul's apostleship. What did Paul do? He preached the gospel as the least of all people. He suffered for his flock. He knelt before the Father in prayer. And Paul expected every believer to do the same. The very first mark of a life worthy of your calling is total humility and gentleness. It is patiently bearing with others in love. The shepherd shows that he worships God, not self, when he subordinates his own interests and his own welfare to the interests of the sheep. A shepherd like that is going to find that his flock is guided and strengthened by God's power. A pastor like that will receive an eternal crown of joy. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us hearts that trust not in ourselves, but in you alone. Strengthen us to imitate Christ our shepherd, regardless of the cost, so that now, through the church, we may you may make your manifold wisdom known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms to the glory of Jesus. Amen.